The problem with nostalgia is it only lasts until you remember more than just the good stuff. That's the problem with this Mad Musings, TSR Star Frontier. Despite people remembering it being one of TSR's core games, the actual shelf life was minuscule. There was only two official source books released before TSR did an aborted attempt at a second edition. Then the entire game was scrapped for Buck Rogers. Despite its brief run, it's still fondly remembered by a lot of older players. But was the game that good, or was that just the nostalgia goggles talking? I'm Mr. Welch, and it's time to blast off into Star Frontiers. Star Frontiers debuted in 1982, with the entire game credited to TSR staff. There were multiple adventure modules written for it, but only three rule supplements. Alpha Dawn contained the starting rules and everything you needed to play. Nighthawks followed a year later and gave the game rules for shipbuilding and combat, something sorely lacking from the original book. In 1985, Zebulon's Guide to Frontier Space Volume 1 arrived, which completely revamped the rules and became kind of a second edition for the game. Despite the Volume 1 tag, that was the last rulebook Star Frontiers would ever see, and the game died in 1985. The rules were a percentile system, similar to Top Secret. You had 8 abilities rated up to 100, though most players capped at 75 to start with. There was a large variety of skills, with the skills rated from 1 to 6, with each point increasing the base chance of success 10%. The technical skills also had the built-in penalty with the complexity of whatever you were working on. The more advanced the device, the less chance of the success. One major part of the game that worked against it was the availability of the races. For a high-adventure space game, there were only three playable races outside of humans to start with. Ground combat in Star Frontiers was strange, as armor consisted of energy shields. There was a different shield for each type of damage, and you'd only have one shield on at a time. Switching shields took several turns, so if you have your Albedo shield up and the bad guys attack you with inertia weapons, unless you spend five turns switching out your shields to the damage type, you just had to suck up the damage. However, since your health equaled your stamina, and your stamina could reach up to 100 points, unless you get hit by some of the heavier weapons, you can tank several shots before you were in danger of going down. Nighthawks added more dimension to the game when it introduced shipbuilding and combat, as Alpha Don's approach to these rules were pretty much just wing it. The book goes all in on everything spaceship related, with the first 22 pages devoted to just building the ship. The ship design does have a unique quirk, is that the ships are built like skyscrapers, with the artificial gravity pulling the crew down towards the engines. There's a fair bit of crunch as you have to allocate space and power, and there are extensive rules on ship maintenance. One particular aspect that is hammered home is the overhaul, as most ships the players are going to acquire can only jump a few times before the ship has to go down for repairs. The combat rules are fairly complicated. And like regular combat, you need the right shield for the right weapon. Compared to the fairly simple rules introduced in Alpha Dawn, the ship rules can be a bit jarring. There's a decent amount of rules on mining if your characters decide that's the campaign they want, and there is some background information on the setting. If your players just want to blow things up, the book does present several scenarios that are meant to be run as a war game instead of an RPG. Zebulon's Guide to Space came out two years after Nighthawks and completely retooled the system to be more like the popular face rip system from Marvel superheroes. The book is more than a bit controversial among Star Frontier fans, because for all practical purposes it was the start of 2nd edition. Characters from Alpha Dawn are not compatible with the Zebulon rules, and TSR never gave players a conversion guide. It added four new races, giving the setting eight playable races and the always evil Sathar as the villain race. The skill system also used the popular face rip mechanics of colored charts, with skill level determining difficulty rather than the skill rating being the actual difficulty. It introduced cybernetics and psionics, though cybernetics were expressly mentioned to be fleshed out in Volume 2, which of course never came. Zebulon gave the setting a much-needed timeline in history, something it jumped into with pages of background. It doesn't give any real information on the origin of the original four races, it just gives the modifiers for them in character generation, and then you have to go back to Alpha Dawn for the explanation of the abilities. So while you know the home planets of the Mechalon or the Huma, the Rusk and Dallasites are barely mentioned in the new rules. There's information on the various factions and corporations for the Star Frontier universe, but any further adventures or rules died with this book. Star Frontiers was TSR's answer to Traveler. It had a decent rule set, if a bit bland with just percentiles determining everything. The lack of a background hurt it compared to the lore-rich settings of Star Wars or Traveler. There was a lot of modules for the game, true enough, but the lack of source books caused Star Frontiers to stagnate, while Traveler is still in print today because of its immense universe, and West End game Star Wars was the second best selling RPG only behind D&D. &D. People remember the Larry Elmore art more than the actual game, and Larry's work on the cover art was some of the best art TSR ever made. There's still a following for the game. StarFrontiersman.com had a ton of fan created support for the game. It created modules, source books, and scenarios for Star Frontiers for decades after its demise. 
There are several other sites that have also contributed fan creations, but that is the largest one that I could find. Unfortunately, Wizards dropped the IP hammer on the website, so a lot of the links and articles they maintain have been taken down, and you'll have to search for the various Dragon magazines and the like for those. I don't know if Star Frontiers will ever make a comeback. Wizards has kept some of the older games in-house like Gamma World, but others like Boot Hill and Top Secret, it let go. The fact that they are protecting Star Frontiers might mean they are looking at a relaunch, but that's pure speculation on my part. The game would probably need a complete overhaul for Wizards' taste. The face rip mechanics are a bit obtuse compared to Wizards' games today, and the Alpha Dawn version was way too much math compared to current games. Still, you can only change so much of a game before it stops being the game that you were originally remaking. I wouldn't place bets on Star Frontiers arriving in stores anytime soon, though. Star Frontiers will always be the TSR game that got a raw deal. From the amount of material released, it never found its place in the TSR catalog. When it finally did get a relaunch with similar rules as the more popular Marvel system, TSR killed the line because Lorraine Williams taking control. Williams had the rights to Buck Rogers and wanted TSR to pursue that property, so Star Frontiers had to go. That gave us Buck Rogers in the 25th century. It lingered for three years before dying because nobody really wanted to play Buck Rogers. This was replaced with High Adventure Cliffhanger's Buck Rogers, which died even more brutally. So if you want to blame anyone for the failure of Star Frontiers, blame Buck Rogers. But not Gil Gerard, he's actually a cool guy, just don't ask him about Season 2. And if Felix Sela's there with him, totally ask him about the Adams Family. The stories he can tell about the behind-the-scene antics of John Aston, Jackie Coogan, and Carolyn Jones, and the rest of the cast will warm your heart. If you want to pick up Star Frontiers, you can usually get most of the books for about $30 each on the various auction sites. That seems to be the going price, and if you're patient, you might find them for cheaper, but you're going to have to be really patient for most of these books. Next time around, I'm going to look at another book in the Fantasy Flight Games 40k RPG line with only war. In the grim dark darkness of the grim dark future, there is only war. I mean only war, there is nothing else.